Hello everyone, welcome to part two of the breakdown series for my recently released medieval short film titled Into the Fire. In part two, I'm going to be breaking down the cinematography phase of the project and show you how we set up the shots and how we lit the scenes. But I'm also going to be explaining a little bit of the motivation behind the shots and why I did what I did. So before we jump into that breakdown, if you're new here, my name is Joe and I own a video production company named Driven Films. And on this channel, I bring you honest and unbiased reviews of camera gear that I use out in the field, as well as breakdowns of projects and tips and tricks that will help you to improve your video work. Now, if that's something you're interested in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, please go back and watch part one of the breakdown series where I cover the entire pre-production phase of the project. So with that out of the way, let's jump right into the cinematography breakdown. So right away, our actor Ron was in costume and ready to go, but we wanted to add a little bit of dirt and grime to his face for the first scene. So we wiped some powdered charred ash from Meron on his face that we got off of Amazon, as well as splattered some fake blood all over his tunic and his face and a little bit of the coif as well. Now, one thing to note is that this fake blood is not easy to work with if you're not experienced with it. I ended up just wiping it on my hands and then wiping it on Ron and uh, that didn't go very well. It was my first time using fake blood. So I didn't realize that it was going to almost completely stain my hands. So that's something to keep in mind if you're messing with fake blood. So first up on the shot list was a series of natural light shots that would be mostly shot from a low angle. Now these shots are part of a flashback sequence that are only on screen for a split second, but I still wanted them to look good. I wanted them to look as good as possible. Now, if this were a key shot for the film, I'd probably have approached it much differently, but with 100% natural lighting and Ron positioned with the setting sun behind him, this gave us some really nice soft lighting across the face. And we didn't even need to use any bounce or reflectors or diffusion. And as I mentioned before, this shot was only going to be on screen for a split second but I did make sure to pay close attention to the shot's contrast. As you guys can see on this shot here, there is nice contrast between the light and dark across the entire shot from left to right. And shooting when the sun was low and not casting any harsh light onto Ron means that we didn't have to use any diffusion or reflectors. And since this was a low budget film that I funded on my own, we didn't have a bunch of extras in the background putting on a big grand scale medieval battle. So I needed to make sure that the background was completely out of focus. So to achieve that look, I ended up shooting at T1.5 on the 35 millimeter Vista Prime. And thanks to the Mavo Edge's internal ND set to 0.6, this allowed me to pull that off. Now, all these shots were filmed handheld, and this provided me a bit of camera movement that helped to sell the fact that they're taking place during a battle. Now, once we got all the flashback shots done, we began setting up our main scene, which was happening at the campfire. Now, the first shot that we tackled for the campfire scene was a medium wide shot of the Crusader sitting at a campsite all by himself. Now, this shot helped to establish a feeling of isolation and loneliness and to show that the Crusader was in fact by himself. We shot this on the same 35 millimeter Tokina Vista Prime as the flashback scene. So we safely built the fire and stuck this sword, which you guys very well may recognize, into the ground and Ron settled into his little campsite so we could start setting up the lighting. The first thing I did was to make sure that I exposed for the fire first. Now, once I dialed in the camera settings to nail exposure for the fire, we began setting up the fill light. Initially, we tried using a Kinotechnic Practilite 802, which is an amazingly rugged bicolor panel light, but the crew and I felt that we wanted to match the flickering of the fire better. So we switched our fill light from the Practilite to a Nanlite Pavo tube set to candle effect. We set the light up on a stand behind a sheet of diffusion cloth on a C-stand. Now that we had dialed in our fill light with the Nanlite Pavo tube, we then repurposed the Practilite to provide a rim light, which was going to simulate the moonlight. We then set it to 5600 Kelvin and added a quarter CTB gel, which cooled the light off to give us that moonlight look that we were trying to achieve. Now, as you can see in the shot, the Practilite with the barn doors gave us a nice controlled backlight that not only added a nice rim light to our actor, but it also lit the mid ground a little bit. And this gave us some nice separation between our actor and the background. Now, as you can see in the scouting shots here, there's actually a pond to camera right. And while it would have been amazing to get some moonlight shining off the lake, 
we couldn't pull it off without an extremely powerful light. We initially tried to light the pond with a Godox VL150, but even at max output, it just wasn't working. So we felt that the background was a little bit too dark. So I had the team put that Godox VL150 with a large softbox. And since the VL150 is a daylight balanced light, we had to add a quarter CTB gel. And to give all the night shots a little bit of added character and to diffuse some of the flames, I added a Tokina Black Alchemy quarter strength diffusion filter. And I experimented with a few different types of diffusion filters like the Tokina Soft Res and the Tokina Pearlescent, but I ended up going with the Black Alchemy since it gave the fire a nice halation and also reduced contrast slightly, but it wasn't overdone. So another detail to note is that it took off some of the sharpness off of the chainmail coif as well as the Templar's face. So the diffusion filter was just another creative decision that contributed to the final look of the shot. Now for the medium shot, we were able to use the exact same lighting setup with very minimal adjustments. We cranked up the Practilite a bit just to add a little bit more rim light and to really accentuate that chainmail, which by the way is extremely heavy. So I can't imagine having to wear a full suit of real chainmail. This shot here, we switched to the 65 millimeter Vista Prime, which allowed us to safely position the campfire between the actor and the camera. Now we were lucky to catch a few embers passing in front of the shot, which I would have ended up adding in VFX later on. So with them wide and medium shots out of the way, it was time to shoot the close-ups. So we switched to the 135 millimeter Vista. One of the last shots that we filmed was this ultra close-up of our Crusader standing in front of the fire. And this takes place right after he's awakened from his flashback and he's confronted by what he believes is the voice of God or an angel. I do wanna to touch on the lighting here and how we achieved this. And we did this by, of course, using the campfire again, and we positioned Ron now to the right or camera left of the flames, and we use this to provide our key light. Just as we did before, we're using the natural light to provide our key. And we were still getting some fill from the flames over here on the right, but it also filled in his beard a little bit. But we basically have a ton of really nice contrast in the shot. We've got our darks, we've got our light, dark again, all the way through, we've got light, and then we finish up with dark. So it's just a really nice, what's called a checkerboard. So we have a nice checkerboard of contrast. And this honestly was my absolute favorite shot in the entire film. And I felt that it just overall really helped to sell his emotion. So with that being said, one important thing I wanna note here is that at this point in the film, the shot has gone from having a mix of warmth from the fire and cool from the moonlight to being almost entirely warm. Now this lighting decision gave this series of shots a more sinister and violent tone as if the character is now face to face with his inner demons and has to pay the consequences for what he's done. So every shot after the flashback sequence has this look. Now on the close up of the dagger, we had the actor stand a bit further away from the fire so that we could get the camera close in and we went with the Nanlite Pavo tubes on candle mode a little bit closer to provide the flickering of the fire. Now, having the actor shaking or trembling as if he's frightened to the very core helps sell the decision that he's about to make, which brings us to the final shot of the film. And that is of our crusader standing in front of the fire about to pay for the sins that he's committed. I pulled reference from shotdeck.com for this film, and for this shot in particular, I gathered reference from Game of Thrones season one, episode 10, and this was the scene where Daenerys and all of the Dothraki are standing in front of Khal Drogo's funeral pyre. And I especially liked how this shot looked. It was backlit, they were standing in front of the fire, and it just helped give me some inspiration for my shot. So again, pulling reference from sites like shotdeck.com is a huge benefit when you're setting up your films. So to break down this shot, the very first thing we did was switch to the 35 millimeter Vista. This basically allowed us to frame the shot so that our Crusader was in the center and we still had a good amount of the background here and we could still see the fire itself. Now, with that being said, the way we lit this was the exact same way that we lit the first shot we talked about, and that was to expose for the fire first. This shot is predominantly lit from the campfire. So we did one test pass of Ron with a little bit of the flames, and then we had Ron stand in front of the fire, do his scene, basically fall to the ground, and then we basically had one shot at it after that. So that being said, again, exposed for the fire first, that provided 
this backlight here. We have some nice outlines here. We have a little bit of outline here, which normally would have been lost if we didn't have that backlighting. We have a little bit here. And as you can see, we have some nice glints on the sword, which creates some separation right here. You see that? It's basically just casting this shadow. And it's just overall looking pretty good. Now, I didn't want this shot to be too heavily lit for the background because again, I wanted to drive home this feeling of isolation and that he's alone. So what I did is I had our VL150 off camera, way off camera, and just pointing here at a very low power. So we just had it illuminating this a little bit so it just wasn't pitch black. Then we had Alex standing off camera with the Nanlite Pavo tube just to provide a little bit of added light to either the foreground here and as well as Ron himself. So again, exposing for the fire first allowed us to determine, hey, okay, so when Ron falls, that fire is gonna become the subject. So we had to make sure that the fire was what we were exposing for. And then we were able to add light as needed. I wanted this to be the focal point. I wanted the fire when he falls so that he's basically just isolated from the background and you see that he basically takes his own life and that is the end of the film. So that wraps up the cinematography breakdown of the short film Into the Fire. Ultimately, we came away from the shoot with a set of shots that we felt looked great and achieved the story we wanted to tell and we accomplished it in just a few hours. Now, I think it's really important to get across the fact that this was produced on a very small scale with a small crew and very little budget. And I'm not saying that to justify any of the decisions or mistakes we may have made, but I want you guys to know that you can produce high quality work on a small budget with a limited amount of time. It just takes the right crew, the right cast, plus a little bit of creative planning. Now, if you guys enjoyed this breakdown, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss part three, where I break down the post-production phase of the film. I really hope you guys learned something from this breakdown. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. And of course, if you have any questions, drop a comment below and I'll do my best to get back to you. And as always, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Until next time, take care.